Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. It's really awesome to be here today and among the trees. And I'm going to take the sound of the freeway as praise. Every time a big truck goes by, he's just saying hallelujah. And uh, so I hope we don't get too distracted by that. It reminds me of a time in 2007 when we were in the Philippines uh, for a faith camp. We had 900 people show up Sabbath morning, and um, somehow the, we were on a campus, and the edge of that campus was right up against a foreigner, uh, a guy from Australia, and he didn't really appreciate the music that was playing at 6 o'clock in the morning very much, and so he turned on, he had a really good sound system, and he turned down uh, the song Highway to Hell um, by ACDC, and he played that over and over and over again from about 7 a.m. all the way till after church. And so we're in a church service talking about faith and following God and, the, you know, and serving Him, and there's this loud, I'm on a highway to hell, blasting right into the, into the congregation. And um, I was amazed at what the people did and what the dynamic that took place was. Is at first, it was very distracting, so we prayed really hard. He shut it off. And then he turned it back on. And this time we're like, you know what? We're just going to focus. And the whole entire congregation, all 900 people were there focusing on the word. And I think we got more benefit from the word that day than if that song hadn't been playing. Because it made us realize two things. Number one, you've got to focus. And it showed the vast differences in spirit between the world's message and the message from Jesus. So you had, um, you had a, a very negative kind of message coming in with a very positive, you know, you had violence and peace just right there. And I think also what happened during that time is that the Holy Spirit put a kind of a shield around the audience. And as you focus on the message, then the Holy Spirit can make that shield apply and, and, and wrap around the, the believer and, and the listener. And um, I praise God that this is true in our individual lives as well. I know that in the past, growing up in college and everything, I, started li I, I would listen to music that I enjoyed. <laughs> and um, when I got saved, I realized that the spirit in that music did not match the spirit that I, that I had found in Christ. And so I spent the next probably 10 years diligently, daily, sometimes hours at a time, esponging, is that a word, esponging? Ex expunging those songs from my head. You know, I'd wake up in the morning, a song would pop into my head, it would play all day long. I hate that. And I would listen to that song, and, it's, and that's not the message that I want to feed myself. That's not the message I want to feed my spirit. Oftentimes, it would glorify breaking up, you know. My wife left me. My girlfriend left me. Oh, I feel so bad. And the song makes you feel so good. Makes you feel so good to hurt so bad. It's like, that's not normal. I don't want to break up with my wife. So I want to put songs in there that will feed my spirit with the message that I want to have. And so I spent years doing that. And, and a lot of times I'd walk into a Walmart, walk into a store, and I'd hear the song, and it boom, it'd like pop into my mind. I'd spend the next two hours, and it took a lot of effort and determination to get that song out and replace it with a song that spoke to my spirit, the message that I wanted, that I wanted in my life and in my family and in my marriage. And after some time, after actually about 10 years of this, I realized that I can walk in and I can hear that song, but it doesn't trigger anything in me. Sometimes I'll hear a song from like, that I wasn't expecting, and I'll like go into that song, and then all of a sudden it's in me, and then I have to spend a few hours, sometimes a few minutes, sometimes a half hour, expunging that song out of my brain, because what we feed ourselves is what we become. And if we feed ourselves the music of the world, the music that has violence, that has the, the beat, you know, all that kind of stuff, that's what we're going to become. And I used to find myself going to church every Sabbath, just enjoying the spirit of the Lord. And then during the week, I'd go downhill again. And I'd come to church the next Sabbath, and I'd like have to get back to where I was. And I started realizing that's because I'm feeding myself all week long the opposite spirit than, than what I've really fallen in love with. 
And so that's why today what I want to share, I'm a little nervous about it, not because I'm nervous about speaking in front of people or you, my family. It's because I feel like I went scuba diving a, a, a while ago, a couple years ago for the first time, and you're underwater and you have this face mask that allows you to breathe. And they taught us that if somebody's apparatus fails, how to take your face mask off and give it to somebody else so that they can breathe. And then you share face masks. Today isn't just theory. Today isn't just ideas. Today, it's like I'm taking my face mask and feeding and letting you take a breath. Now, you guys probably already know all the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. It's not rocket science. It's in there. You guys are probably way ahead of me. But this stuff is powerful for me, and it's what I live by. Um, and if you get bored, <laughs> I have a, a, a good solution that works for me. When I feel like the pastor is really boring, I just start praying really hard for the Holy Spirit to fall on him. And it works. And I don't know if the Holy Spirit falls on him and makes him more interesting or falls on me and makes me hear the message rather than the style or distractions or stuff like that. So that's a little tip. Okay. Um, I want to start out with um, an illustration. Okay. The title of the sermon is, uh, is uh, Strings Attached. All right. So what does that mean? A lot of people are afraid of that. Are there any strings attached? Okay. Free, free sandwich. What's the strings attached? You know, that kind of thing. But this time, it's totally different. If I point with my finger, this is an illustration that came from C.S. Lewis. If I point with my finger, if, a, if, a, if, my, if my family looks at that, or if, if a human looks at that, they'll see that I'm pointing to something. Okay? So they'll see, I'll, I'll, like, I'll go like this, and she'll look over there and see what I'm pointing to. Or you all will do that. If my dog looks at my finger, he sees my finger. <laughs> he won't see what I'm pointing at. He'll see my finger, and he'll wonder, is there something good on daddy's finger? And I think I'll go sniff that to see if there's some wet meat or something, or some popcorn oil or something that I can lick his finger. You see what I'm saying? This is the difference between a materialist and somebody that is open to the presence of God, open to uh, the being of God. Uh, we look around, we see these trees, and the materialist will say there is no origin higher than what we can see. There's nothing that I can believe in other than what I can see. But all of these trees, all of this nature, all, it yells, it screams design. And if it screams design, it requires a designer. And so there's all these evidences of the designer, of his amazing power. I mean, if you start to analyze the systems that are at work in this one tree, has anybody counted the molecules? in this tree. There must be more than 50. <laughs> and the strings or the capillaries, the tubes that go from deep down inside all the roots that we can't see that somehow pull water out of the ground and take them 50 feet up into the air and do something with the sun. And so all these systems, and, and there's hundreds of pounds of water. They say in a big pine tree that it can lift five, six hundred pounds of water in a day that's going through this tree. So all this intense system that's happening in this tree, and yet it's totally at peace. I think of a little puppy. Puppy's born. It's, it's got all these systems. It's got the endocrine system, and it's got the GI tract, and it's got the, the blood and the heart. Praise God. Praise God. And it's got all this stuff going on, and yet it's just sitting there without a care in the world. Who can do that? Who can set up a, 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 a design like that? Usually, if you have a very complex design, you've got to have somebody that's watching over every aspect of it. And yet God can do this. 
And so all these indicators that there is a God who is omnipotent, wise, and super at peace. They're everywhere. But we can walk through all these indicators, all these fingers pointing, and not even notice. It's what's in our eyes, what we see. And what I want to do today is find out how we can how we can have a closer walk, how we can have a breath of fresh air from the divine, from the things that we cannot see. And when we first started in ministry, I really started to grapple with the idea of, okay, I want to serve God who is invisible, but I want to do that in a way that is visible. In other words, somehow I want to transfer what I know about God into feeding children, into sponsoring Bible workers, into doing something physical that's going to make a difference in the world today. And I started to realize that it is the, you know, you have the two worlds. You've got the spiritual and you have the physical. And I realized that it was the spiritual that drives the physical. Okay? In the spiritual world is where my mind starts to think about things and ideas happen and I get an idea, oh, I want to do this. I want to do something. So then that works itself out through my flesh and body to go and do that physical. And a lot of times I get tied up, I get really, what can we say? I fall in love with the things I can do. That's physical. I love to be able to help people. I love to be able to go and, and uh, see kids eating in a full stomach and a smile on their face. I love that. And I love to, and I, and I can do that by the tools that God has given us in this day and age. They're very different than they were 20 years ago. We can do all this stuff uh, virtually. In fact, I can sit at my home and operate a ministry and almost 10 different countries right now, all at the same time. In fact, right now during this COVID, it's been a huge, I don't want to say huge blessing, but it's been interesting to see that while we're locked down and we can't travel, normally, I mean, right now, I'm supposed to be in Asia right now, but even when I'm locked down, we've got 11 expansion programs going into areas that I probably wouldn't have done if I was out traveling. And it's like, how does this work? How does this happen? Many times I get excited about what I'm able to do, what God gives us the ability to do. And I start doing more and doing more and doing more and I actually get addicted to my doing. I get addicted to the work God has given me to do. And I start to, re I start to burn out. I start to lose, I start to get negative. I start to kind of like lose interest, lose excitement for that. And I lose, I a lot of times fall in love with the work more than, than the God, the, the Lord of the work. And I found this quote, my friend Jem Castor brought it to, my, to our attention a few years ago, which I think puts it into perspective. This is found in the fourth manuscripts release, uh, page 113. You can talk to me or search it on the internet. But it says, man can accomplish nothing without God. Now, a lot of times we lose sight of that. And we look out and we see high rises built by people that don't serve God. And we say, what does it mean? They've accomplished that without God. Are you sure? I think there's two things we can say about that. I believe that God is allowing them to do that. You know? I used to think, Lord, how come you are blessing the unbeliever with all that wealth? You know, the, the wealthiest men in the world are, are unbelievers, non-believers. How come you're blessing with them with that? And the most recent understanding that I've come to with that is God loves them so much that he wants to give them some happiness, even if it's temporary. And also, it's God's goodness that leads us to repentance. And so praise God. 
Praise God for that. But man can accomplish nothing good without God. Man can accomplish nothing eternal without God. And we all want to make our lives effective. We don't want to work our entire lives and at the end of the lives come up with nothing. We want to do something in this life so when we come to the end of our lives, there's something to show for it. And that day that we come face to face with Jesus Christ, are we going to have regrets or are we going to have something to offer him? Are we going to say, Lord, I, I watched 4,000 movies. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> you know, I survived. Christ is going to say, where is the flock that I gave you? What have you done with the resources that I've given you? So, man can accomplish nothing eternal without God, nothing worthwhile without God, nothing worth dying for without God, nothing worth saving without God. And God has arranged his plans. So, with this statement, we can say, okay, God, you do it all. I'm just going to wait on you. I'm just going to wait and see you do it. But he said, this says, and God has arranged his plans so far as to accomplish nothing in the restoration of the human race without the cooperation of the human with the divine. Okay, so we can't do anything worthwhile without God, but God can't do his plan and his will on earth without us. You've heard the statement, let go and let God? I say, no way. Grab hold of God's hand and see what he can do through you. That's because we, we want to see something happen in this world, amen? We want to see this world impacted for Christ before the second coming. Because we're not going to be able to do that after the second coming. After the second coming, we'll never be able to go and find an unbeliever and say, hey, know the Lord. This is what Jesus is like. After the second coming, we'll have no more opportunity to grow the population of heaven. Now, we want to impact the world. Okay. So we have this cooperation between human and divine. And a lot of times we feel, I feel like, well, I'm going to work, 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 and then pray. Work, 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 and then pray. But he's kind of dependent on me doing it. And I get it off balance. So then I go into this Pray, 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 do no work. Pray, 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 do no work. And that's off balance too. The Lord has this, I mean, he's like, I don't know, I feel like a ping pong ball sometimes. I go the, too much, too, I usually go to just doing too much work. That's my human tendency. So here is the next statement or the next sentence gives us a, the proper perspective on who does the work and what part, okay. The part man is required to sustain is immeasurably small. Yet in the plan of God, it is just that part that is needed to make the work a success. Okay. Praise God. All right. How big is it? How big is the part that man is to pray? Play? Immeasurably small. How small is immeasurably small? It's so small, you can't measure it. So our part in this work is unmeasurable. It's that small. Just to give an idea, or just to give an, a, a, an example, let's say you, you go to walk out the door. You grab the door handle, you pull the door, you walk out the door. Do you have any idea what you just did? Do you have any idea of all the atoms that you just moved in God's universe? No, we have no clue. We just turn the knob and somehow all these atoms, all these molecules all work together and they open the door and you walked outside. As you walk outside, how many atoms of oxygen did you displace? Have you ever calculated the aerodynamics, the air swirling around you and the little eddies behind you as you walk through the... No, we have no clue what we're doing, but God does. He's got all that calculated. He knows down to the neutron and, and the quark, every quark that you affect as you breathe. All these things, <laughs> we really have no clue. And yet God has arranged his universe 
so that the little piddly things we do have an effect on his universe. It's amazing. But our part is immeasurably, immeasurably small and yet necessary. So if you say, well, my part is so small, why even try? It's because without us trying, nothing will happen. God's arranged it that way. A lot of people have said to me, well, if we don't give the gospel to the world, God will find some other way to do it. He'll use the angels. That's false. That's false. That's a lie. We are his plan A, and he has no plan B. And I've seen it with my own eyes. If we don't give the gospel to the world, the world will not receive the gospel. He might find some other person to do it, but he'll always use a person. And the amazing thing is, is that when we cooperate with the divine, we receive more of the blessing. That's where the blessing lies. The biggest, the big roadblock that we run into right now is motivation. Motivation. Why would I go and do that? Why would I go out there? Why would I go door to door? Why would I go across the ocean? Why would I sacrifice the good thing I got going right now? And I've actually heard people tell me, well, we're waiting for persecution. God's going to have to bring persecution into the church before we'll be motivated to go. Do you really want that to happen? I don't really want that to happen. I would like to do this work while it's relatively easy. <laughs> I would like to do it now while we have opportunities. And we can see just in the last few months how easily those opportunities can disappear. If we were called to take the gospel to the world now under these conditions, how would we do it? It's illegal to fly to India right now. You can't. It's illegal to go in. Well, it, the way will be hemmed up more and more and more. And yet this work must be done. This work needs to be done. So as this persecution grows, we have more motivation. Let's say persecution comes to our house. We lose our food. We have more motivation to seek God, but we have less opportunity. As the persecution is taken away, we have less motivation, but we have more opportunity. So up until recently, we've had a huge amount of opportunity, very little motivation. In the 1900s, the 20th century has seen the greatest boom in economics. More wealth was generated and enjoyed by more people than in any other era of history that we know of. Travel has become so much easier. The first missionary we sent was Jay and Andrews. We sent him to England. It took him two months just to get there. No short-term mission trips for him. And I believe that this huge economic boom in the 20th century is a result of the missionaries in the late 1800s and early 1900s praying for breakthrough. They, they go out there. They see opportunities. By the way, in... Um, 1906, uh, the Adventist Church, which had about 80,000 members at that time, sent out 566 missionaries. In 2013, the North American Division sent out 233 missionaries with a membership of just over a million people. And so the missionaries in the beginning, I believe, were praying, God, we see all these opportunities. Please send funds so that we can take, make use of these opportunities. And the Lord says, okay. And there was a little delay. But what happened was as the blessings came in, desire for foreign missions faded away. So for the last 70 years or 80 years, there's been a continual decline in foreign mission giving, foreign mission interest. At the same time, the economic boom was going up. So what do we do? Uh, a few weeks ago, I was coming home from India and uh, had the opportunity to go through Israel. 
instead of going straight home, I could go through Israel and Greece and I get home for the same price. And I thought, we are working, one of the biggest challenges in, um, in Thailand is that people think of Christianity as a Western religion. Praise the Lord. And not realizing that Jesus was born and raised and lived and worked in Asia. And so we want to do this television show series where I bring a Thai pastor over and he talks about the life of Christ in Israel with the theme that Jesus was an Asian to hopefully break down some barriers to the gospel. So I wanted to go to Israel and I spent four days traveling around the country, rented a car just to see if that was possible. And Sabbath morning I was going to spend a few hours in my prayer and I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, I have something else for you. So I got up at 5 o'clock, jumped in my car, and I looked at... Uh... Oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> and I looked at my map. I was like, where is... You remember the town, the village Nain? All right, where is Nain? Because that night, that Friday night, I was spending the night in Nazareth. I don't know if anybody's heard of Nazareth. All right, yeah, spending the night there. Uh, which is so cool. Anyway, I'm like, where's Nain? I was like, oh, that's 15 minutes that way. So I jumped in my car and I went over to the village of Nain. And I just sat there and I you know, took pictures and I'm looking, I'm reading the story of what Jesus did. It's like, that is so cool. This is where it happened. And then I'm like, okay, spent about an hour there. It's like, what else is in the area? What about the Mount of Transfiguration? Where is that? So I look on my map, oh, that's 20 minutes that way. So I hop in my car and I drive to the Mount of Transfiguration. It's like amazing. I get there and it's all fogged in and nobody's there, it's all closed. I go up to the top and I start reading through the Desire of Ages about the story of, of when he was transfigured. And I was so moved by Jesus' prayer life. Okay? It's like he worked hard all day. Disciples were super tired. They'd been busy all day. That evening, people left to go home, have their supper, go to bed. He started climbing up this mountain. The mountain's pretty tall. And they climb for, I don't know, must have been an hour at least to get to the top. And then Jesus starts entering into prayer. And the disciples are like, oh, he's praying. Okay, we should pray. So he's, they start praying. And, and then it gets dark. Jesus keeps praying. And Jesus prays with strong tears. Okay. And the disciples see that, but they're praying their normal prayers. They fall asleep, and Jesus keeps praying. The dew falls. He doesn't notice. And after some time, Jesus receives what he had been praying for. He was praying for his disciples' faith. He was praying for a demonstration that would show that his disciples' faith had not been in vain. He was praying for a supernatural manifestation so that they would see, oh, Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus is who we think he is, but all outward appearances show that he is just a carpenter that had some wrong ideas. He's going to, because they wanted to crucify him. I mean, all this stuff was going to happen. He was going to have a, what appeared to be a complete failure of his ministry. And so Jesus was praying, Lord, do something that would strengthen their faith. Now, what's interesting is that when Jesus came and all the things that he did on this earth, did he use his own power? Did he come as God or did he come as a man submitted to God? Submitted to God. So he did everything that he did, he did as a man submitted to the Father. Okay? You remember when he went to feed the 5,000, what was the first thing he said to his disciples when they realized the need? He said, you feed them. And what would have happened if the disciples had said, okay, 
It would not have been the Jesus feeds the 5,000. It would have been Thomas feeds the 5,000 or John feeds or Peter feeds the 5,000. It would have been the people, the disciples would have fed those 5,000 people. See, Jesus is our example in all things. The reason they didn't feed the 5,000, they didn't think they could. They didn't see who they were. They didn't see who they were to the Father. When they were in the boat, remember Jesus was fast asleep in the boat and there was a storm and they thought they were going to, and, and Jesus, um, you know, they prayed to Jesus, they went to Jesus and Jesus rebuked and everything went calm and then he rebuked them. It's like, I thought that's what we're supposed to do. When we get into trouble, we pray to God. He fixes the problem and we praise him. But in this case, I believe why Jesus says you have so little faith was because they could have calmed the storm. The disciples could have calmed the storm. They just didn't think they could. And there are promises in the Bible that we tend to skip over. Promises like, if you ask anything in my name, I will give it to you. And greater works, he that believeth in me, the works I do, he will do, you will do. And greater, greater works than what Jesus is doing is what he's saying his followers can do. And you say, well, that's not possible. Jesus is the greatest. Well, it actually, um, Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 19 demonstrates that saying. In Acts chapter 5, Peter was ministering in a town and he was so filled with the Holy Spirit that people would just lay their sick in the street and Peter passing, his shadow would fall on them and they'd be healed. Acts chapter 19 when Paul was working as a tent maker, they would take bits of pieces of his clothing, handkerchiefs, and they would send them to people in distant towns, and they would be healed from that. Now, we in the scientific age, we feel very uncomfortable with things like that. We feel very uncomfortable because that doesn't make sense. And, we don't, and so we tend to push away anything that is of the miraculous because it doesn't make sense. We can't explain it. What we have done is developed faith in the scientific rather than in God and his word. But Jesus is our example in all things. And this is why he calls us to pray, to pray and faint not. If we look at Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, we're going to start with verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. Okay, if you look at the word faint in the original language, there's, it's made up of two words. The first word is ek. The whole word is ekakeo, and I might be slaughtering that word, but anyway. First word is ek, which means out of, okay, or from. And the second word is kakos, which means evil, okay? So basically this is saying that men ought always to pray and not to be out of evil, not to come out of evil. And what is Christ doing here? What he's saying is... Where is your thoughts? Where is your mind? Where are your eyes looking? If you are looking at your problem and you go into prayer, looking at your problem, focusing on your problem, your problem will get bigger and bigger and you will lose heart because you see the problem so big and how in the world is God going to solve this problem? I don't think he can. See? The other side to that is if we go into prayer looking at God. Looking at God. 
and we start to see who he is. We start to see his nature. We start to see his heart. We start to see his works, what he's done in the past, what he's planning to do in the future, what he has done right now. We start to see who he is, and we start to realize that in, when we enter into prayer, we're entering into the realm of the impossible, the realm where nothing is impossible. There is not a single thing in the universe that is too hard for God to fix. But we lose sight of that so easily. We can't see him, but we see evidences. We see fingers all around pointing to what he can do. The children of Israel were in Egypt. Ten plagues, ten things hit them, supernatural things. The river turned to blood. Anybody see the river turned to blood lately? I've never seen that. Frogs everywhere, lice, hailstones, darkness, all these things. And then when they left, they got to the edge of the Red Sea, and they lost their faith. And in Psalms 106, it says that this, they sinned because they didn't figure out what God was like. They lost sight of his great power, which means God can do anything, and his great love. Psalms 106, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> and why would that cause them to sin? Because they didn't think God can do anything and he loves me. Now, I love my wife. Just want to say that publicly before anybody else gets any other ideas. <laughs> no, she's good. When I married her, all of my resources, which is limited, all of a sudden become applied into her life. Okay? So she needs to go to church. I have a car. She's coming to church with me in the car. My car fixes that problem for her. She needs orange juice for some reason. Early morning, I, I can go get orange juice. So I jump in the car, go down and get orange juice, bring it to her seat. Because I love her and I have extra resources, all, my, all the resources, if she got sick, I would do everything I could to make sure she got well. If that required going to the hospital, if that required, you know, mortgaging, well, we don't really have anything, but anyway, if, yeah, whatever it took to bring her back to health, I would apply it to her. This is the relationship God has with us. See, it'd be okay if there was a God out there that was supernatural and super powerful. He'd be floating out doing his own thing, and I've got to deal with my own problem. But knowing that he loves me, thy maker is thy husband, all of a sudden, all of his resources are tied into my life to overcome the problem that is in my life. That's huge. Luke 15, at the end, the father says to the son, the elder brother that was angry, he says, all that I have is yours. So when Jesus entered into this prayer, he realized this. He saw this. He saw who he was with the Father. And a lot of times we don't see who we are to the Father. But when God said, in him I am well pleased, he was speaking of the human race. He was speaking to us. He sees us as his own son. Know you not that you are crucified with Christ? If you be crucified, you are risen together and seated in the heavenlies. This is where we are. This is where we are today. This is what Christ did. And we don't have to do anything to get that. We can receive it because Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. Yeah, I am crucified with Christ. When was Christ crucified? 2,000 years ago. It doesn't have to happen again today. We accept that by faith, and it becomes real. So as Jesus went into his prayer, he saw this. He saw that his prayer was talking, he was, it was him talking directly to his father, and his father was hearing. And even though it was the Son of God, fully God, fully man, speaking to the Father, he persisted in a prayer that I'm not sure I've ever experienced or done which is a prayer of 
with tears, intense agony, but not praying for himself, not praying for a problem to overcome, but praying for a, a special thing to be done so his disciples will strengthen their faith. And God did it. Right there, the heavens opened. Elijah, Moses came and talked with Jesus. The disciples were waking up. That was awesome. Wouldn't that be awesome if that would happen again? There's a story. Is anybody familiar with Josephine Cunnington Edwards? Okay, a few people. All right. A great missionary, amazing storyteller. She tells a story about her brother who had lived his whole life not accepting Jesus Christ. Just not interested. Everybody else in the family was a believer except him. And so she got together with her church group and they prayed hard. I don't know how long. I need to go find it. It's on a cassette tape. Anybody seen a, what cassette tapes are? I mean, know what cassette... Anyway, the, with the pencil thing, you know. Anyway, um, they started praying and Jesus walked into the room where he was sitting and he knew it was Jesus. And he said, why are you holding out? And he just broke down. And when his wife came home, he was in the kitchen pouring his bottles of alcohol into the sink and pouring, and he was just like. So this has happened in our day. This has happened in our day. This is possible. These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick. Uh, lepers, raise the dead. Snake, all that stuff. Hmm. I want to start in the Lord's Prayer. If we go to Matthew 6, and I'm going to close on this. I knew this was going to be a really short sermon. <laughs> Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, you know, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So what is that? That's praise. In Isaiah uh, 60, verse 18, it describes a city, the city in which the walls are salvation and the gates are praise. So how do we enter into that city? Through praise. How do we enter into the presence of the Father? Through praise. Praise and worship. What is that? That is turning our eyes towards him to see him. And as we see him, he becomes magnified in our minds. As he becomes magnified in our minds, the problems that we deal with in life become smaller and smaller and smaller till we see that he can do anything. And we start to pray then with faith. <laughs> pray with faith and pray with determination. Mrs. White was talking to an angel, and she says, why is there not more faith and power in Israel? And the angel says, you let go of the arm too soon. He says, grab hold, don't let go, press your petitions to the throne with a determination that will not be denied. The promises are sure, and you shall have what you ask for. This is an open door. This is a huge open door for us. And I don't want to continue to be satisfied with just what we've experienced so far. I don't want to be satisfied. I'm not satisfied with just doing the basic stuff of what we're supposed to do as Christians. The door's open for something more. I want it. I think we all want it. You know, we've had this, this thing stamped in our identity as Laodicean. It's been with us so long that we're used to it. We're comfortable with it. We call ourselves Laodicean. We have no idea how to get out of it. We have no idea how to get out of it. But I think the solution, again, Jesus gives us the solution. Buy of me gold, white raiment, I salve, and let me in so we can spend time together. And this is, the, this is the oxygen that I've found. 
when I look at the world and I see all the things that have to be done before Jesus can come, I get overwhelmed. I get discouraged. And so I go into his presence. I say, Lord, this is impossible. I don't know what to do. What's, what am I supposed to do? Sometimes when I'm editing and I, and I come up against a brick wall and I, I can't figure it out, I go into his presence. Lord, what do I do? And I spend time in his spirit. And you know what? <laughs> His spirit is not sleeping. His heart is not heavy. His, he is not engrossed in Laodiceanism. He has enthusiasm, optimism. He thinks this is, this is, this is going to work. So when I go into his presence and I sense his spirit and he gives me peace and I can surrender everything into his hands and then he gives me a little idea what if you do this okay so I go try that all of a sudden boom 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 huge things okay our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, brothers and sisters, is our assignment as Christians. That's our assignment, to bring heaven to earth, to go into heaven, to see what's happening in heaven, to get the spirit, to get a taste of heaven. Bring it down into the situations that we face walk through the situations, walk through our daily lives, intermingle with people that are struggling, bring heaven down to earth. That's our assignment right there. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does it look like for God's will to be done? Give us this day our daily bread. In heaven there's no lack. So as we bring heaven into this earth, we will supply the wants, we'll supply the needs of his people. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There's forgiveness, there's peace making between each other, which is really needed today. And so on and so forth. This is our assignment, to bring heaven down to earth, to bring heaven into our families bring heaven into our marriages, to bring heaven into our co-workers' lives, to bring heaven wherever our influence can reach, to bring heaven to Bangladesh, to bring heaven to India, to bring heaven to Africa, to bring heaven to wherever God calls you. And there's a lot of places in this world that it's, they could use a taste of heaven. There's a lot of places in this world that could use a taste of heaven. So the door is wide open. The door is wide open. And you might say, well, what about my career? Trust me, God can handle that. He can take care of you. He can take care of you. So where does it all start? It starts right there. It starts in the secret place, going after God. Going after God the God and entering into his presence, that realm where nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Let's close with our closing hymn. I believe it's 108. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. I didn't turn it on. Amen. Can you all say amen to that amen. beautiful sermon? Thank you so much. I was encouraged to keep persevering in prayer and increase faith. Let's all stand together. Amazing grace. All five verses.
was grace that on my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed the word my hope endures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have Bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. Amen. What an amazing perspective. We've been there 10,000 days, 10,000 years, each one of you shining like the sun. We won't have run out of time. We will, even, we will not have even begun to deplete the time that we have there. I say heaven will be cheap enough for us and for others. But heaven begins here. Heaven begins here. And heaven is a ceaseless approaching to God through Christ. Let us go to him now. Father, as we close out this amazing day in your nature, Father, we see what we want, but we don't have the energy and strength to get there. We are so weak, Father, we can't even reach out and grasp these promises. I ask specifically for your Holy Spirit to arouse our spirits to pray, to ask for things we've never thought possible, to know how to pray, to see your face, and to praise you. Father, strengthen us to praise you, to turn our eyes on you, to really just to do that, to look at your works and to figure out what kind of God would do this kind of thing. And just spend time there as we see your face as we are in your presence, through your word, Father, our faith will grow, our willingness to pray, our, our courage to pray will grow. We need this, Father. Without your Holy Spirit, we cannot live the life that you've called us to live any more than Mary could have been impregnated without the Holy Spirit. Father, we are 100% dependent on you. We're 100% dependent on your Holy Spirit, even to bring the words of the Bible to life. Father, we're asking for revival, personally, individually, and we're praising you that this is your will. In Jesus' name, amen.